Hello, ladies. Welcome back to my podcast study of the book of Titus. Today we will cover chapter two. We will read the NIV and then the King James Version and go in detail just as we did last week. I also want to remind you that I'm going to be giving away a free scriptural spiral notebook to one of the persons, uh, ladies who signed up. And I'm going to be announcing the winner next week. And next week will be the last podcast of this study of the book of Titus where we'll be covering chapter three, Lord's Will. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. And so, so today, let's go to God in prayer and then we'll go into the study. Let's go and go to God in prayer right fast. Holy Father God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you, Lord, for this huge opportunity and privilege to be able to share your word with the listeners, godly Christian women around the world today. Please open our eyes and ears and heart to the truth, Lord. Give us wisdom to understand your word. Guide my steps. I pray that I explain your word rightly divided. I need your help. And I pray that we all understand your word. Open all of our eyes and ears and heart to your word so that we'll apply it to our life and give us the courage, wisdom, desire, and strength to obey your word. And to do your will in our lives. Thank you for loving and caring about us. Thank you for listening to us and answering our prayers. Forgive us of our sins. Thank you for your countless abundant blessings in our life. Thank you above all for you and Jesus, the Holy Bible, and the Holy Spirit. Please bless everybody here listening in who are grieving, who have lost loved ones, who are having a hard, difficult time in life, who are in pain, having health problems. On and on, Lord, please comfort them, heal them, strengthen them in every way, shape and form. Bless them, bless their family. And thank you for being so good to us. Bless the church here in America and all over the world. And the poor and persecuted tr- Christians, bless them too, Lord, everything they need. And help them and just be with them, Lord, as only you can. So thank you, Lord, for listening to us and answering this prayer. We know it's not in vain. In Jesus' name, we thank you in advance and say amen. Okay, ladies, so last week we covered Titus chapter 1. We discussed that Paul, that Paul was originally a Pharisee and he persecuted the Christians. He wasn't the original 12, but God, Jesus converted him on the road to Damascus. And Titus was his uh, protege or his, he, he mentored Titus. And Titus was his companion when he went to Crete. And he sent Titus to Crete to appoint elders in the churches. We also learn and discuss that Titus is basically a handbook or a letter on how to organize the church and how to train and appoint church members and church leaders. And how to train the members and church leaders. Okay, so that's what the book of Titus is about. So I also want to cover again that we notice in the book in uh, in chapter one, I just want to briefly go over where we was reading in verse five, Titus chapter one, verse five, where he says the King James Version, he says, for this cause left I thee in Crete that thou should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And so I just wanted to cover that he appointed elders. The word elder singular is not mentioned in the Bible in general. It's always referred to as elders. If you look up the scriptures, if you type in, you go to a uh, the Bible on the computer and type in elder, elders. Is, uh, the word elders is usually or mainly or always used in a plural sense. And so... Each church is to have elders or bishops, not one. Today we see a lot of churches make the mistake where they'll have one bishop. But that's not the scriptural organization of the church according to what we read in the Bible. Here in Titus as well as Timothy. Basically even all the way back to the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy. All through there we see that the the nation of Israel, even they, they had elders. So in the in the Old Testament with Moses, the leaders of Israel, they had many elders and overseers. And so elders is usually plural, not uh, 
singular. We now also can see scripture in Acts chapter 14, verses 23. You don't have to go there. I'm going to turn there right quick to the book of Acts. Since we're studying that on here today. So Acts 14, 23. Let me see if I have that right. Acts 14, 23 says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And so there were elders, not one elder. It says elders, plural, in every church. So the churches, according to the Bible, is to have elders, not one person. God never expected or wanted the church to Jesus. When I say God, I also mean Jesus uh, in general. And so he did not want, Jesus did not want his church to have just one elder. He wanted elders. He did not want one person to monopolize the organization, the the managing or administration of the church. It was, should be, he wanted it with elders, deacons, teachers, preachers, evangelists, all of that, not just one person. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Like I said, in the last study, we're living in the last days. And so it's harder and harder to find a congregation of the Lord's church that's following the Bible let alone denominations or non-denominations. Just even in the Lord's church, it's hard to find a church of Christ, the Lord's church or church of God that's following the scripture. So today, unfortunately, people, as we read in chapter one, people just kind of do whatever they want to do without, don't, don't have much fear of the Lord. Okay, so, so yeah, we're living in the last days. Therefore, there are many in the world and church who are corrupt, even some church leaders. So this is why it's vital to make sure those ordained as elders truly do meet biblical qualifications. And so that's the responsibility of the church members. The other church leaders, such as the deacons, preachers, teachers, and the regular members, is our responsibility to make sure that those who are ordained as elders, they qualify. And the reason we see so much corruption in the religious slash Christianity world today is because those who are being ordained as elders, they don't meet these qualifications that we read here. Okay, and so, but yeah, we're living in the last days. And so we want to pray, obey, do our best, and we want to address things when we see it. But ultimately, the responsibility isn't up to us, especially us women. You know, if our husband's an elder or deacon, that's one thing. Or if he's a leader in the church, you know, and speaking in general, we only can do so much. And so sometimes all we could do is pray, if not walk away and find somewhere else to worship. But it's like this world, the religious world is just, of course, the world is even worse. But the religious world is, is, is could be doing better, too. But it's not because the church leaders aren't, aren't uh, doing right. And one of the reasons they're not adhering to the word of God is because as members, we're not holding them accountable in general. I'm not pointing a finger at any one of us, but we're not holding them accountable. And so that's where the problem lies, because as I was saying, there's not a lot of discipline or disfellowship according to the word of God as we're supposed to be doing. And so that's ca it's causing problems where we're all suffering from it. We're all suffering. This Christianity as a whole is suffering from them. But this was all prophesied and predicted in the Old Testament and the New Testament that this would happen. Paul said the wolves in sheep clothing was coming. And Jesus said some things similar. And so that's what we see happening today. So let's begin right now. So let's right now we're in Titus chapter two. I'm going to read the NIV first. And then, like I said, we'll do the King James. Hold on. Let me drink some of my tea right quick. <clears throat> okay. So, so Titus chapter two, the NIV, the title over chapter two says doing good for the sake of the gospel. It reads, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Likewise, 
teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Verse six, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Set them an example by doing what is good in your teaching, show integrity seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Verse 9, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. And so that was the NIV version. So now let's see what the King James has to say. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, Teachers of good things, verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Verse 5, young men likewise exhort to be sober minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorrupt uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in the things, not answering again. Verse 10, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority Let no man despise thee. And so that's the King James Version, Titus chapter 2. So let's see if we can break down some of these passages and we'll go back uh, back and forth between the NIV and the, and the King James Version. So, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And so as we discussed last in the last lesson, sound doctrine means healthy doctrine well-founded, established doctrine. So that's what he's telling Titus to speak those things that are sound that you have heard us teach. He's saying what you heard us teach, what you heard me, Paul teach. 
speak about those things that are healthy, well-founded, established, not some frivolous stuff that somebody said, somebody's opinion. This is what he's saying, sound doctrine. Okay, in verse 2, he says that the aged men be sober. So he's talking about the older men in the church right now, the older men. Because down uh, later we could see he was also addressing the younger men. So right here he's talking about the older men in the church. I'm going to guess they're about 40, 50 on up, 60, 70, 80 on up. He's saying that the aged men be sober. So he's telling Titus to teach the church this. These are teachings on how the church is to be organized, how the, the leaders and the members are to be trained. This is what he's saying right here. Okay, so that the aged men be sober. And so sober, sober means, where's my word? So sober means it's not just not doing drugs or being a drunk. It means sober also means being clear headed. So it does mean to not drink or be a drunkard. You know, not being tipsy. He's, he wants us to be sober. So it also means clear headed. So someone he's a straight thinker. This is what he's saying. Okay. So someone who's sober, who's sober, grave. Grave means someone who's mature, serious, dignified, and thoughtful. So who's mature, serious, and dignified, and thoughtful. It's not someone who's who's always telling jokes, who's just, you know, being a jokester, or he wants someone, he wants a, the young, he wants the age men to be mature and serious, and not jokesters or wishy-washy. He wants them to be temperate. Temperate means to have self-control, sound in faith. And so, again, that means healthy, fitting, well-founded. That's the type of faith, sound in faith. And so, in charity, so charity means unconditional love in word and in deed. Patience, that's long-suffering and kind. So this is what how the older men are to behave in the church. And this is how their lifestyle should be. They should be known as a person who is sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, full of charity or love and patient, which is also love. Okay. And so now we have verse three. Verse three, the aged women. Now he's talking about the older women. So my guess is 40 years and older. So the aged women likewise. That they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things. And so holiness, so holiness, that means pure, whatever the Bible tells us to be. He's going to explain what holiness is if we just keep reading. So holiness, not false accusers. So that would be not false accusers. That would be a person that's going around lying on people, gossiping, uh, judging, misjudging fellow church members, accusing them of doing stuff that they didn't do or maybe they do and they don't they're not applying a proper understanding as to what really happened, like both sides of the story, that type. Just going being a busybody in people's business. Just talking too much. Not giving too much wine. That means that they're not a drinker or they're not a drunkard is more accurately. They're not giving too much wine. That means they're not known to be the type of person that's drinking a lot and teachers of good things. And so they're not giving too much wine. Okay. So a lot of people probably don't probably have a misunderstanding on drinking when it comes to the Bible. So for many years, Probably over 20, 20 years, I believe that Christians could never drink, that Jesus didn't drink. Okay, so I'm just going to cover this briefly. Okay, and so that kind of, it's like I believe that Christians shouldn't drink at all, ever, ever. And so I was also taught incorrectly that Jesus didn't drink, Jesus never drank, and that at the wedding feast, his first miracle that Jesus served non-alcoholic wine. 
Well, after doing a lot of studying about, I don't know, for some reason it bothered me. I don't know why. First of all, I don't drink. I don't drink. I used to drink, but I don't drink today for reasons that I'll cover. Okay. And so anyway, so Jesus said that he was comparing himself to John the Baptist. And he was saying how people were looking down on John the Baptist. When John the Baptist, he said, John the Baptist didn't come drinking and eating meat. He said, but I did. He said, the son of man came drinking and eating meat. Because we know John the Baptist was a Nazarite or like a Nazarite. Nazarites could only not drink, could not only not drink. They also couldn't even eat grapes or raisins. So if you don't know a lot about the Nazarites, you can look up the Nazarite. Look up what the Nazarites were. It was a vow that they made to God. To basically dedicate their whole life to God or, or a certain portion of their life to God. So... Okay, so Jesus said the son of man came drinking and eating meat. And I just remember thinking, why would Jesus say he came drinking? Why would he say that? Every word in the Bible is there on purpose. It's not an accident. And so I couldn't understand why would Jesus say he was drinking? So I've done a lot more studying and everything on that. Okay, and so in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people at that time. There was no Christians back then. You only had the nation of Israel. They were God's chosen people. They were allowed to drink alcohol, especially wine. Wine was given to the Levites, which were the priests at the time, as an offering. God even told them that they could give the Levites wine. So I encourage you to do some more study on this in the Old Testament if you don't, if you're not sure about it. Okay. So, so they could drink in the Old Testament. Jesus died under the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they were allowed to drink. So Jesus did. Jesus drank wine. He probably drank wine at the wedding. The, the wine that he drank, it was not non-alcoholic. It was alcoholic wine. It wasn't the alcoholic wine they make today. A lot of wine they make today, they add extra alcohol to it. They add distilled liquor to the to make it stronger. Okay, so it's not the same. But they did drink alcohol in the Old Testament. Jesus drank wine. The Bible says Jesus never sinned, but Jesus drank wine, alcoholic wine. He said it. And so I'll put the... uh uh, I'll put the scripture in the notes. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I'll put the scriptures in my note. And when I put this up on my YouTube channel, I'll put the scripture there. Okay, so yeah, so Jesus drank. He said he drank, but the Bible says Jesus never sinned. And so drinking wine is not a sin. It's being drunk. That's the sin. And so then a lot of people, then we go into speculation on what's drunk. And so I'm not going to cover that now. Not going to cover that part. And so, but it's not a sin to drink. And so here, this is why he's saying in verse three, not given to much wine. He's not saying that she can't ever drink, that the older women can't ever drink. He just saying they're not giving too much wine means they ain't always drinking. Or they probably don't go to drinking parties. And so I've heard people say that social drinking is a sin. There may be some truth there. There's some truth there. But then all I'm saying is that the Bible does not teach that a Christian can never drink. And so if someone has a wedding and they serve wine, I wouldn't do that. Not today as a devout Christian. But when I got married, I probably would serve wine. But so if a person has a wedding and they serve wine at the wedding, that's not a sin. Even at a Christian wedding. It's the getting drunk. That's the sin. And just drinking all the time. So like you always have a glass of wine or alcohol in your hand or you, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to go into detail. because Today we're under the law of liberty. I'm not telling people to drink. I don't even drink. I don't drink because I want to stay sober. Uh, God, God has a lot of things for me to do. It's not healthy. There's a lot of downside to drinking. Matter of fact, I don't think there's any benefits to drinking. When the Bible talks about Timothy drinking, when he told, when Paul told Timothy to drink for his stomach's sake, that's because back then wine was not wine. Yeah. Wine and alcohol was used as a medicinal. 
And so that's why he told him to drink for his stomach's sake. This is why he said that. But drinking in general is not a sin. It's the how much we drink. This is why it says not giving to much wine. Okay, remember the elder, he wasn't given to wine. And I think also the deacon, uh, my memory served me correct, he was also not given to much wine. So that just basically means, remember I was saying we have to use common sense when we when we interpret the word of God. And so that means that they're not drinkers. You go over their house, they probably don't have no alcohol in their house. They don't have a bar. You come to my house, I'm not, uh, you come to my house because this scripture is talking to me. I'm an older woman in the church. There's no alcohol in my house. There hasn't been alcohol in my house in uh, over a year minimum. Okay, so I don't drink. And this is what he's talking about. She's not giving too much wine. She's not a drinker. If you go to our house for dinner, you probably don't most likely you're not going to get served wine. Okay, so I'm speaking in general. But like I know, I know a lot of churches, a lot of church Church leaders or teachers, they teach that we can't drink at all. And then they incorrectly teach that Jesus did not drink or the wine he served at the wedding was not alcoholic. That's not correct. Because in the old Jesus died under the old law and under the old law, it was there was no they could drink. I don't even know if it was a sin to get drunk, but I know that they could drink and they even gave wine to the priest to the priesthood. So just do a little bit more studying on it. Okay, so yeah, teachers of good things. So that means that, let's see what the NIV says. Teachers of good things, let's see. Uh, likewise, teach all the women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Okay, and so teachers of good things. So my guess is teaching the Bible. It's like I'm doing right now, teaching the Bible and what's right. And what's good as opposed to what's evil. So what's honest and fair. So that type of thing teaches of good things, not bad things, not negative things, not worldly things. Okay, like I guess my guess would be based on other scripture, wives tales. I guess, did we read that? What Jewish fables or, or wives tales? Some One of these books in the New Testament talks about uh, wives tales. And so gossip, slander, just crazy stuff like uh, this crazy stuff. OK, verse four or anything that's not Bible. OK, verse four, that they may teach the young women to be sober, love their husbands, to love their children. So sober, once again, we've already went over that what sober means. And so he God even wants the young women to be sober, not just the older women. Okay, and also the men. So God wants church members to be sober. Now to the young women, the ones that's married, he also wants the young women to love their husbands. He wants the older women to teach the younger women this. See that they may teach the young women. So as older women, we got to teach the younger women. Not just go have a regular Bible class where we just sit there and read the book of what Revelation or Matthew or go in the Old Testament. But he's saying we what we really need to teach the younger women to be sober, how to love their husbands, to love their children, to basically how to be a wife. So verse five says to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So so God wants us. Jesus wants us older women in the church that's 40 and older to train and teach the younger women how to do these things. And so that's what I'm doing right now. So I want to go uh, into some of the meanings of the words. Okay, so he says to be sober, to love their husbands. First Corinthians 13 uh, teaches us the real definition of love. So love is patient. Love is kind. Okay, so a lot. Of, so God wants us to be kind and patient with our husbands, married ladies. He wants us to love our children, so that's to be patient and kind, just in general, forgiving, all that with our children as well. So God wants us to love our children. We can't just assume everybody knows how to do these things. Why? Because God put it in the Bible. So somebody needs to know this stuff. I know I didn't. I got married young. A lot of stuff I, know, I did not know. 
Of course, I didn't think I should hate my husband, but I didn't know. I didn't know it like the Bible is teaching it right here. Okay, and so we are to love marry ladies. We are to love our husbands, and we are to love our children. So with so if you have children, whether you're married or not, God wants you to love your children, to be patient and kind with them, and forgiving. So look up Corinthians uh, for the sake of time. I'm not going to go there. So look up uh, Corinthians chapter thirteen, First Corinthians chapter thirteen, and tells us about what love, the definition of love. And verse 5 says to be discreet. Discreet means having good judgment, quiet, gentle. Okay. He wants us to be us uh, to be chaste. And so chaste means innocent, pure, a virgin before marriage or celibate after, restrained, modest, not sexy. We live in this society today where everybody won't be sexy and hot. Everybody won't be like Beyonce or Rihanna or Nicki Minaj or Britney Spears or what is it, Adriana Grand, if that's her, Ariana Grand, wherever her name is, something like that. You know, uh, people want Madonna, Janet Jackson, just, no, th these people are not our role models. They need Jesus just like everybody else do. So yeah, they're they're not uh, uh, our role models. Okay, so that's what chase mean. Chase also means to not adorn yourself, not decorate yourself. I know some people, some church leaders go too far. As I was saying before, they try to tell women they can't wear jewelry or makeup or whatever. But the Bible says to do things in moderation. That's part of being discreet and chaste. It's not only being innocent is or pure. It's also doing things in moderation. And so it's like not being flashy. You know what I'm saying? I know when I was younger, I used to be flashy. I wore my bright yellow shirt. I had my long dangly earrings. I had my makeup, my extra pink lipstick hot pink lipstick and i wanted my hair all over the place and and so i'm not saying there's anything wrong with wearing yellow i'm just saying that you know that that's what god wants that's that's being chaste it's not only being a virgin or chastity that's where the word come from chastity it's not only being a virgin it's also not over decorating ourselves and so we want to do things in moderation and so for me, it would be wearing earrings. Just I'm just we're being thoughtful of how we dress and like what are we, who are we trying to impress? Are we trying to impress God or we're trying to impress the boys or the men? So that's the question we want to ask ourselves. And I don't expect everybody to be on the same level that I am. I'm in my fifties. It took me a while to get to this point, and I didn't get here until what over a, a little over a decade ago, about fifteen years ago. 2000 the early 2000s okay so 15 almost 20 years ago but i'm in my 50s and so it's so so god god get, under god's grace and mercy he gives us time to grow but we still should be growing forward going forward and upward being like christ more and more each day being discreet and chaste more and more each day okay so i hope this makes sense i don't want to come across too too hard because we're under the law of liberty we're under god's grace and mercy today you're not going to find a scripture book chapter verse that say don't wear no earrings or don't wear a wig or don't wear a lip gloss or nothing like that so it's to do things in moderation not to be trying to be sexy or alluring attracting a lot of attention just you know, when you walk in a room, you want to be noticed. We want, as godly women, we want to be noticed for our general quiet spirit, not because of what we're wearing. Okay, so I'm just speaking in general. I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but this is what the Bible says, and we we need to know this. And so we at least know what to attain, what we're trying to attain. Okay, this is what we're trying to attain. Keepers at home, that means she's not running the streets. The young women, we the we older women are to teach them to be keepers at home. Stay home. Take care of your house. Clean up the house. Wash the clothes. Have dinner ready when your husband come home. If you don't have any kids for the single women out there or that's divorced and raising their kids, this still applies to us. We shouldn't be out running the streets trying to find a man. I know some single women want to get married. I understand that. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
But we want to be at home as godly women. We want to be at home. We want to have the reputation of being a homebody where we're at home with our children, whether it's helping them with their homework and school and just their activities and everything. That's what we want to do. Okay, young ladies, young women, that's all we want to be. And everything we're teaching, the older women like myself, we have to do this ourselves. Okay, and so I have to do this stuff. I can't just tell you what to do and not do it myself. Okay, otherwise I'm a hypocrite. So I have to follow this too. And I do, I follow this. Do I stumble sometimes? Yep. Yeah, I stumble. I'm a human being just like you. So we all stumble, but this is what God wants us to aim for. This is the ideal, what God wants. This is his principles and commands. And if we're not able, if we're not doing these things right now, we just want to pray about it and ask God to help us do it, to give us the courage, wisdom, desire, and strength to do these things. Okay. He wants us to be good. And so good is being good is being, whereas I wrote some of these notes down, good is being uh, honest and fair. He wants us to be honest and fair type people, obedient to their own husband. So if you're married, God said, obey your husband. I know this ain't always easy to do, especially if our husband is not, you know, if he ain't following the, the what the men's supposed to do. If he ain't doing what the aged men supposed to do or the young men to do, it's kind of hard to listen. And so this is why it's so important for, for even men, you know, to, to lead their families right. To follow the words of Christ and hear what we're reading. The apostles doctrines. But if you have a husband that's not adhering to the word of God according to the book of Corinthians. God says by obeying his word. That by obeying God's word it will encourage your husband to be a better person or be or a Christian. Okay so that's why we still got to obey. Even when our husband is being naughty. I'm speaking in general. I'm not talking about if he's beating on you. Or run in the streets and won't come home sleeping around on you. No, we 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 don't have to put up with that. I'm not saying get a divorce. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to make a point that that's not what I'm saying. So, yeah, we need to be obedient to our own husbands. And so that's why I try to do my husband. I mess up a lot. So I'm apologizing to my husband probably at least once a day. I might say something to him and I'll apologize. I'll say, honey, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that or I'm sorry for snapping. Please forgive me. I repent and I'll just do better or try to do better the next day. Okay. And taking care of ourselves, our health. When we take care of our health and our spiritual health, it makes it easier to obey our husband. So the more you pray, the more you work on your relationship with God, these married women, I'm talking to us married ladies, younger married later, ladies. The more we pray to God, work on our relationship with him and study the Bible, the easier it will be to do those these things. But if we're not obeying the Bible and we're not working on our relationship with God, ain't none of this going to be easy to do. Nothing in the Bible is going to be easy to do. If we're not putting God first, Matthew 6, 33 says, seek first his kingdom and your and his righteousness. And so if we're not doing that. It's going to be hard to do anything. The Bible say do. <laughs> OK, so that helps. So the more we study, pray and obey, the easier it is to study, pray and obey. OK, so just try to keep that in mind. The more we study, pray, and obey, the easier it is to study, pray, and obey. And so a lot of this, some people are just probably listening to this and going, I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. Well, you got to apply yourself. You got to apply yourself. And so when we put God first, these things become easier to do because just on their own, especially if this is your first time hearing it, you don't want to do what it says. And a lot of women, especially in denominations, oh, no, they hate the word submission or obedient. They hate it. And so... <laughs> This is what the Bible say, not me. I'm just sharing it. <sighs> okay. And so then also says that the word, verse 5, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And so the NIV verse 5 says, so that no one will malign the word of God. So that basically means so that no one will give Christianity or the Bible a bad name. And that's what we see going on in the world today. Okay, we see this in the religious world today. People don't respect the word of God. They don't respect the church. They don't respect Christianity. They don't honor, respect God. They just believe God exists and that's about pretty much it. 
And the reason is, is because like he's saying, when we don't do, he says that the word of God be not blasphemed. And so when church members, those that know better or should know better, especially at the leadership, the top, don't do what the Bible says, these teachings here, it gives Christianity a bad name. And a lot of people don't want to go to church, don't want to be Christians. They put the church down. They mock the church. And so we're partly to blame this. This is going to be hard, hard to probably accept what I'm going to say right here. But the chaos that's going on in the world, the church is to blame for 50 percent of it. We're to blame because we're not doing our part as a whole. I'm not speaking to anyone specifically, but overall, the church is not doing its part. I don't care what church you go to. What congregation you go to overall, we could do better. We can do more. I'm speaking in general. But overall, Christianity as a whole, we have fallen short big time of doing what God has called us to do. But like I said, it's in the last days. We're living in the last days. And so it's probably going to get worse. But God is in charge. And so we don't have to worry about it. But we want to do our part. God has his part to do and we have our part. And so, but if nothing else, we can't control the church, definitely can't control the world, shouldn't even try. But we we can't control the church, especially being godly women and Christians. We can't control the church in general. The church is run by men. And so we can't control them, but we're just responsible. God is only going to hold us to be accountable and responsible for what we're doing. We don't have to go out and try to control the church or force them to do what they what the Bible says to do. We are called to have a genuine quiet spirit. In general, that's the brother's job. That's the men's job, the elders and the deacons and the preachers and the evangelists. That's in te- Bible class teachers, that's especially the men. That's their job. And so this is why God telling us to do this. He wants us to be keepers at home. Not that we can't help out around the church. There's plenty of work for women to do in the church. Okay, but that's not, I'm just saying, don't lose no sleep thinking about the, the how the church is messed up in Christianity. Don't lose no sleep. Jesus is in charge. He knows exactly what's going on. He's going to judge accordingly. Okay, and so whatever situation you're in, just pray about it. Keep your eyes open to the word of God. That means read your Bible, stay in, in prayer and communion, and God will open your eyes, and he'll bless everything. And whatever he won't, we know whatever won't be fixed out, he'll handle it on judgment day. So verse seven, oh no, verse six. Yeah, so now he's talking to the young men. Young men likewise exhort to be sober minded. So he's talking to Titus again, telling Titus, who was a leader in the church, telling him uh, what to teach the church, the young, what the church is to do. So he's saying, young men likewise exhort to be sober minded. So that's clear headed. And you can't have a clear head if you're smoking drugs and drinking too much and being drunk and just being a drinker. You want to stay sober. I don't just as generally speaking from experience, because uh, I, I drank, man, for a greater portion of half of more than half of my life. I drank in too much. You can't think clearly when you're drinking, even if you only drink one day a week. It's really alcohol. Alcohol distorts the thinking. So it's really just not good. It's just not good. And like I said, the wine today, it ain't like the wine was in Jesus day. It did have alcohol, but it wasn't as strong like they make it today. Well, all the extra liquor they put in and just just drink some grape juice. OK, first, I'm serious. OK, verse seven in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptedness, gravity, sincerity. Okay, and so, so gravity and sincerity, let's see what the NIV says, verse 7. It says, in everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching show integrity, integrity, seriousness, verse 8, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. That's the NIV version. Okay, so yeah, just uncorrupted means just being righteous. Just do what's right. Don't be crooked. Corrupt people are crooked people. Okay, and so I didn't look up the word gravity to see what that meant. I'll put it on my YouTube version. But um, sincerity, sincerity, that means being honest. 
Sincerity means being honest, means honest of good faith. So honest of good faith. And gravity, that means being serious. That's what it means. I think I said that. Yeah, grave and gravity, that's the same thing. So it means being mature, serious, dignified, and thoughtful. Not not constantly joking around. Just being serious-minded. You know, people could take you serious. And when you're teaching Bible class, man, it's just like, it just feels good when, when there's a man of God, whether he's a preacher, elder, deacon, or whatever, or just a man in the church. And he's just serious about God's kingdom. That's that's what he's talking about. Verse eight, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed of having no evil thing to say of you. So sound speech again, that means healthy, feeding well founded. That means well founded based on the word of God, the Holy Bible, King James Version. Okay. So that having no evil thing to say of you. <sighs> okay, so that means his reputation. He has a good reputation when it comes to church matters or the kingdom of God or just his life in general. No one can say anything bad. This is this is the young man. So my guess is under 40. Under 40 years old, young man. This is my educated guess for today. Okay. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary. That's a person that probably could be uh, uh, like he was talking about earlier. Those are the circumcision group. The Jews. Or people who still trying to keep the old law. Which we have a lot today in denominations. Even in non-denominations. Even in the Lord's church. We have people. Church leaders. Bible class teachers. Preachers. Elders. Whatever. They're trying to have us keep obeying the old law. We ain't under the old law. There's some people even today still think people got to be circumcised. Ain't nobody got to be circumcised. Ain't a woman thank God. But ain't nobody got to be circumcised. That's Old Testament. That's for Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the nation of Israel. Okay, remember I taught in the rightly dividing. And so he said, having no evil thing to say of you. And so when we live right, upright lives, when we just basically follow the Bible and do what it say, can't anybody say nothing bad about us? Not justly. They can't say it and be justified. They can't do it. Verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Uh, the NIV says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything to try to please them, not to talk back to them. So today, in general, slavery is illegal. Slavery has been outlawed, thank God. And so unfortunately, there is slavery, but it's, it's uh. It's illegal. It's underground. So I was watching a news program not too long ago, and they were saying people work in nail salons, uh, massage parlors, and I guess some of these restaurants, maybe Asian restaurants, and just all different type of, could be Middle Eastern, whatever. It could even be African places run by black or white people. He's saying a lot of these people, they're, they're, uh, he didn't say that, but I'm saying that they're saying that today there are still illegal uh, slavery going on, even with this sex trafficking like that. They call it just call it being trafficked now, human smuggling and things like that that's going on. And so anyway, back this so slavery is over with. <clears throat> so the king, so the King James says, exhort servants. The NIV says, teach slaves. Okay, so today, so most people say that it means just your employer, and I agree. And so the, your employer, he's saying just do, just uh, listen to your bosses, do what your bosses say, you're superior on your job, don't talk back. And that's a good philosophy. That's a good philosophy. That's the way I was raised. I never talked back to my bosses. I did whatever they said. And uh, and he says, and to please them well in all things, not answering again. So just don't talk back. Just do what they tell you to do. And today in this this generation today, we see a lot of younger people. I'm going to say 40 and under or 30 and under. They don't respect people in authority over them. They don't respect the police. Not as much as they did when in my generation or our generation. They don't respect the police and stuff. That's not good. 
Okay, so verse 10 says, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they, all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And so purloining means to steal or take things without permission. But showing all good fidelity, fidelity is being loyal, faithful, and devoted. So he's saying, be loyal, faithful, and devoted to your bosses on your job. And he said, don't be taking stuff from your job. That's the purloining. So I know a lot of people, they take things from their job without asking the boss. I used to be like that. We Some places I used to work a long time ago, we would take paper and pencils. We didn't see it as stealing. We just took the stuff. We didn't even think twice, no conscience about it at all. Just no conscience. And so since becoming a devout Christian, I realized I don't supposed to do that. I, you know, getting an office paper, even if it's just a few sheets of paper, taking a couple of pens home, that's their, that's their things. It's not ours. It's not ours. I remember one time when God finally opened, when God opened my eyes to this, like I said, since becoming a devout Christian in 2003, when God opened my eyes to all this, I remember I had this one job. And it was clear across town and I had accidentally, accidentally put a couple of pins of theirs in my purse. They had these real, real, real nice pins that I knew were expensive. They were probably $10 a pin, but they were real nice pins. When I saw those pins in my purse and I think I had drove about five miles, I think it was my last day there too. It was my last, it was a temporary assignment. It was my last day there. And I drove around. I went all the way back. I drove over five miles. I went all the way back, took them pins back. They weren't my pins. I didn't ask, could I have them? And I don't know if they would have said yes or not, but it wasn't mine. And so that's what when we are, when we become devout Christians, which is God's plan for all of us, these things bother us and they should, they should bother us over time. Okay, so I'm not trying to condemn nobody in this lesson. This is what we should be attaining to. Okay, all of we ain't reached all of this, all of us. And those of us who have reached this, we stumble. I stumble. I've reached all these, all these levels, but I stumble at times. We all do. But even I'm still growing. I'm still growing. I'm still growing because I like wearing lip gloss. And uh, earrings. And so I'm still <laughs> I'm still growing too. But I ain't trying to be sexy. They ain't happening. Nope. Only at home with my honey bun. Okay. So 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 verse 10. Not purloining. But showing all good fidelity. That they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior and all things. So he's saying. Be a good example on your job. You may encourage your boss. To obey the gospel. To become a Christian. This is what he's saying. So verse 10, the NIV says, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. So that's to make people want to be a Christian. This is what he's saying. When we live right, this he's teaching in principle. He's teaching in principle. When we live right, we encourage other people to want to become Christians. So that's what he's saying. But when we don't live right, we make people look down on the church Just like he said in the other verses up there in verse 5 Okay, so let's try and finish this We're almost done We're almost done So adoring means to show love for In that verse 10 Adoring means to show love for Okay, verse 11 For the grace of God that bringeth salvation Have appeared to all men The NIV says For the grace of God has appeared That offers salvation to all peaches, all people Okay, and so the grace of God that bringeth salvation does doesn't mean that we're saved by grace alone. That's not what they're saying. It's saying that brings salvation. For the grace of God that brings salvation have appeared to all men. Then he tells us what is he talking about. Just keep reading. Remember I said that? And sometimes I forget. Just keep reading. He'll explain himself. So he says, for the great verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to all men. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, and so denying ungodliness, that's worldliness, being worldly, untamed, or wild. Basically what we see on TV today, pretty much every channel. 
It's what you see on TV. MTV, BET, HBO, uh, uh, Hulu, Netflix. Uh, who else are out there? Amazon Prime, YouTube, Facebook. There's just so much ungodliness, man. It's everywhere. So that, that stuff that we see out there, yeah, uh, 2B, on and on, all of these, uh, uh, Roku channel, uh, Pluto, I'm just trying to think about it, all of these channels, they just have so much ungodliness, it's just, we don't want to be like those people, that's what he's saying, deny ungodliness and worldly lust, anything of the world, we should live soberly, there's that sober word again, Clear headed, not doing drugs, not being a drunkard, righteously or not heavily drinking or being a, drinking a social drinker. Righteously, we should be righteously and godly in this present world. That's what he wants. This, this is what he told Titus to teach and what teachers today are to teach the church. <sighs> okay, in verse, uh, uh, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So we're just waiting and waiting for Jesus to return. His second coming. That's the blessed hope that we have. Jesus coming back and taking us to heaven with him. Okay, that's the blessed hope. And verse 14, we're almost done. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Peculiar people is distinct, special, unique, notable, remarkable. That's what God wants us to be. Distinct, special, unique, notable, and remarkable. And when we follow these words that we're reading right here, that's what we will be. We will be distinct, special, unique, notable, and remarkable. Isn't that beautiful? We'll be, we'll be remarkable. Okay? Okay, and so in verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So let no one hate you or look down upon you. And NIV says, these, these then are the things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. He said with all authority. That means that when we teach the Bible, book, chapter, and verse, we have the authority from God. We are, we are God's mouthpiece. Okay, so that's what we want to do. Okay, so so that's Titus chapter 2. If anyone have any questions or comments, let me know. I didn't hear anyone say anything. Uh, I didn't see any any uh, questions or any emails from you guys. So anyone had no questions this time. So if you have any, so we'll share them with me. I'll share them here next time. If you have any questions or anything, any prayer requests or anything, message me, terrytemple7 at gmail.com. I'll also be uploading this on YouTube for those who want to watch it on there. Okay. And so uh, I wanted to uh, say hi uh, and do a shout out to Jeanette and Denise and Deborah and uh, Angie. I just want to thank you all for your comments and everything uh, on the study. So thank you guys for, for giving me a shout out and tell me that you're enjoying the Bible class and everything. Okay. So don't forget next week is going to be, we're going to do chapter three. It's going to be the last study. And I'm going to be announcing the winner of the very beautiful spiritual bound uh, spiral notebook. Okay, so I hope you all enjoyed this lesson. Like I said, if you have any prayer requests or anything, don't hesitate to let me know. Send me an email, everything. God bless you and keep you. May you always be a blessing wherever you go. Chat with you later. Until next week. Bye-bye.